That's what we like. Okay, this is not really a quiz, but this is just a few little things that we didn't cover on um, at this point in, in, the, in the conference. So um, let's look first of all at this patient right here. So this is a 52-year-old male who has a history of all things of pancreatic cancer, and he's had a recent PET scan that's negative. So how important is a recent PET scan that's negative? What do you think, Richard? Um, I think the PET scans are pretty sensitive. They're not that specific. Um, but we've had cases where PET scan is negative, um, and uh, it's missed things. And we've had cases that have been positive, and there's nothing there. So it's not a 100%. Um, the other problem we have is if it's a very small lesion. That's too small. It's too small. Yeah. It's not metabolically active. It's not going to show up on it. No, so, so you have a cystic, really cystic pancreatic lesion. Uh huh. You may not have enough uptake in the solid components to actually be able to see it very well or get a number that's suggestive. No, that's a great answer. I should never have asked you. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely right. So the thing about the PET scan, actually, though, is that you know patients are really, they're very, very reliant on their PET scan results. And so a lot of people have serial PET scans depending on what cancer they have. And so then when they have negative PET scans, they are um, perhaps falsely um, reassured that there's nothing going on. And there's no question about it that not all tumors are PET avid for sure. So the, the, of course they tend to do PET scans for the appropriate tumors. But, um, but that in addition, all the things that you mentioned can make it so that the PET scan's not always the bee's knees. So in any case, so this patient has a CT scan shortly after, so he's alternating PET and, and portal phase CT. So what are we gonna say about this CT scan? Anybody? Oh, I haven't shown it to you yet. I have two screens here, I can see it. Okay, so um, what, what are we gonna say about that? Or what are they gonna say to us about this? How many doctors are left in here? And Richard and... So there's about a one and a half centimeter low attenuation lesion. And I'm even wondering if there's a little dip salt in the left lobe of the liver. Yeah. Also, um, that um, it's not specific, we really don't know. No, so, so this observation of a low attenuation mass in the liver the, the, this um, um, situation where there's a low attenuation mass in the liver, this happens every single day, every single day in every, just in every CT department, everywhere. And so before I came to Calgary, I don't know exactly what they did to resolve these. Sometimes they do regular ultrasound, and what they're trying to do is confirm, especially if they're very low attenuation, that they're just cysts. But, but certainly contrast ultrasound to resolve these is just really... Great, and my MR guys just say, Stephanie, we don't want to resolve them. We don't do better. So they, they have problems with them as well. So there's that low attenuation mass. So this patient has obviously been in surveillance. So one of the questions, of course, that's very important is, is it new? And so if it's new and it's a low attenuation mass, and it's a patient that's had a previous pancreatic cancer, it's worrisome, but they don't know. And the patient has that negative PET so they don't know what this is. So now when we look at it on ultrasound, so what do you think about it on ultrasound? Ultrasound techs and doctors all welcome. So is it a simple cyst? No, no perfect, that's great, you've learned. Maybe you didn't learn that from me today. <laughs> you knew it before you came. Okay, but so definitely not, right? It's not a simple cyst, so it's a cyst and it's got a lobulated kind of solid border around it. It's a kind of unusual looking lesion in my mind. And so what are we going to do? Oh no, don't tell me. Oh, it's work. maybe it's gonna work. It is, ha, perfect. Okay, so we inject the contrast, and so what do we think after we do the contrast? Just watch it for a minute here. Pardon me? So there's thick septations that are somewhat, uh, have little nodules on them. <clears throat> so we're, and they're all enhancing. 
Yeah, that, so that kind of solid lobulated margin, it enhanced. It hypo-enhanced, is that fair? So it's hypo-enhanced. Yeah. It's not quite as enhanced as the rest of the parenchyma. Okay, so now we're going to look. Maybe this is a different movie. I don't know if or maybe it's the very same one. But so, so definitely this is not simple, and there's enhancement related to those abnormal solid components of that mass. So now we're going to look at some, oh gee, so many pictures. So now we're going to look, um, and so over time, we can see it as enhanced with heterogeneity and low attenuation relative to the liver, and then it washes out more, and then it washes out more. Um, this is something that I moved from another presentation, and the fact I never use black arrows. Who would ever use a black arrow? They look awful anyways. I'm, I'm sure that there's numbers in there that tell us what time it is too, but they're undoubtedly black letters now. They've somehow moved. So anyways, so so what do we think this is? Unequivocally, we can say this is what? Any, anyone? A suspicious from malignancy. <laughs> no, this is a MET, right? So this right. enhances, so, so this is a, a focal mass that has um, a solid and a cystic component and the solid component enhances and then washes out rapidly. And I'm sure that under, under here somewhere there's the numbers that tell you that that happened in less than a minute. So without that information, you're, you're at a loss for sure. But so this is a MEP. And so we said that this was a most unusual metastasis. And so this actually was proven and this is a metastatic cystic lesion from the pancreas. So how often do we see this? We don't see it very often, but like one of the times when I was in Toronto, someone wrote a little email to us and said we would have inter, um, just radiology body rounds between all of the all of the institutions in Toronto, and so someone wrote an email that said bring your cystic metastatic lesions to rounds tonight, and so I was absolutely astonished at that rounds. Like I had two really good cases of metastatic renal cell is often cystic. And metastatic um, lung I had never seen before, but there was lung, there was renal cell, there was just about everything. And so these cyst cystic lesions in the liver, what I learned from that day at rounds was actually never cast them off. They can be very significant. And if you have a patient with something like a, med a gist or a sarcoma, those cysts can just grow like crazy and be very, very necrotic very quickly. But this one was a pancreatic cancer. You now, know, I'd add one more point. You know, yeah. if you look at that lesion on the right where there was no enhancement, oh, yeah? if you did a biopsy there, you may not get a good specimen. So doing ultrasound with contrast to find where the vascular area is, yeah. is very useful to when you're doing an FNA to make sure you get uh, adequate specimen for interpretation. You're absolutely right. Like when you look at that picture right there, um, um, that is a, a case where you could end up with a, with a negative. Because I think on the CT you couldn't see that. No, you don't. And if you biopsy the the area that's that cystic area on the right, you probably would not have gotten a good specimen, and you may not have gotten a diagnosis. No, that's absolutely right. And and of course, um, um, even though there are many many places in the U.S. that do do biopsy with ultrasound, there's still lots that do most of their biopsy with CT, which just shocks me. Anyways, so metastatic. Um, now. So this case, I expect you to kill. Okay, so this is a patient who has that picture. So what do we see there? A lesion. Yeah, a solid and hypoechoic lesion in the liver, nicely seen. And so, and so what do I know about this person? I know nothing. So what's the next thing I'm going to do? That's it. You saw it. You're very quick. <laughs> so that's absolutely right. So I don't know anything about that patient. And so for me to make a good interpretation of whatever I'm going to say, I need to know what the elastography is. So who knows? This is on a, a lovely Samsung machine with a lovely Samsung display. And so who, who knows these displays well enough on that machine? Is that abnormal or not? So it looks like it says it's 2.5 meters per second, is. which is consistent with cirrhosis. That's it. And so that's what we thought as well. So this patient has a cirrhotic liver that wasn't previously well broadcast. So a cirrhotic liver with that focal hypoechoic mass. Now, here are the MRI vibes. So there's the APHE and the late phase vibe. So what are we going to say about that? Sorry? 
So on, on the on the APHE vibe, what does that mean? It means it's got arterial phase hyper enhancement. And so then what happens to it over time? It's sustained, right? So it's showing it's enhancing and it's showing sustained enhancement. And so and so are we worried? We're, we're kind of worried, but we don't know what it is. And so what I started to say before when we were talking about this is that when you have, um, looking at all the whole spectrum of nodules in a cirrhotic liver, is that some tumors, like, um, I always explain to patients this way. If you have a, a lung cancer or a colon cancer or all kinds of different cancers, you, the question that they ask is, do you have cancer or not? Like, do you have it or don't you have it? And so either the answer is yes, you have colon cancer, or yes, you have lung cancer, or no, you don't have it. Whereas in a cirrhotic liver, it's very different. So what happens in a cirrhotic liver is that there are nodules everywhere in a cirrhotic liver. And these nodules, by a process that's called hepatocarcinogenesis, convert from a benign regenerative nodule that's trying to fix the liver, trying to repair the liver, and that that nodule will slowly undergo change over time. And it will, as it changes, it will grow bigger. It will get progressive um, dis, um, dysplasia in the vessels, like uh, the, in the, the cells. So the cells will go from being liver cells to being not totally normal liver cells to ultimately becoming cancer cells. So a little tiny cancer will develop in that nodule and then it will become ultimately a bigger cancer and then take over the whole nodule. And so I tell patients that, that this is, like I say, I can see lots of bumps in your liver. And I said, I say to them, I'm worried that some of these nodules are trying to become a cancer. And patients really understand that. And I say to them, it's like being on a step or taking a step and a step and another step. So when the patients come back, I can tell they really understand that. So then when they ask me, they say, has the nodule made more steps towards the cancer? Because <laughs> they know I'm worried about something at the beginning. But so, but so what happens is we see nodules that end up characterized in LIRAS as LR3 and 4. But one of the very common things that happens is that they enhance and they don't wash out. And so over time, as they become more established as an HCC, they will start to wash out. And so that's one of the reasons why it's not absolutely a slam dunk to say, oh, that this is going to be a cholangiocarcinoma or something, because we don't know. But so this vibe right here, um, it doesn't make me say that it's HCC, it doesn't make me say that it's ICC, but it makes me say this is abnormal and we should do a contrast ultrasound. So that's what happened. So the patient comes to have a contrast ultrasound. And so when we look at the contrast ultrasound, we can see very easily that we confirm exactly the same as MR in the arterial phase. So we show that this is an arterial enhancing mass. So it has APHE on ultrasound as well. And so then we do, as I said before, I never do one injection, I always do two. That was transverse, this is longitudinal. This is better, partly because it's longitudinal. In any case, it's got APHE. So that's at the peak of the arterial phase. At one minute, and at two minutes, and at three minutes, that's gone. And and so what do we think? We think that this is dis, um, discordant. Now the question is, is it at one minute, has it got washout? And so this is the kind of question that someone asked me earlier today from your table, I think, is that very subtle, ch subtle difference. And so I've got to well, step into the audience. Do you think it looks like it's got weak washout at one? Yes. <coughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> That's for sure. And so, and so um, what do we think? We think that this is, is LRM or in that category. And so what do we think that that is? We think that um, this is a non-hepatocellular malignancy. And so the explanation, that's what we've looked at all day today. So that discordance between the scans. And so this, this is a, actually a case I just saw. So non-hepatocellular carcinoma, we talked about this, permeable vascular endothelium, MRCT contrast, goes into the interstitium, ultrasound contrast stays in the vessels. And if that's one of the things that you take home today. That's one of the most important things. And so this is cholangiocarcinoma. Now, so anyone, let's have a look at this. So this is a patient. So tell me what we're looking at and what we see. Maybe this is too easy for you, Richard. 
<laughs> okay. The question about the timing is whether it occurs before one minute. So the timing is independent of the intensity. And so when it first washed out, it was weak. There's no question about that. But it, it's, um, it's weak. And so, and so consequently, um, I'm not worried about it. I'm going to call that LRM. Rapid, if it has rapid or marked washout, I'm going to call it LRM. Oh, no, but at one minute, it's washing. It's washing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good... Yeah, you got it. If it's washing out before a minute, we don't want it to wash out then. And Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's excellent. It should be ISO. It should still be ISO. ISO or hyper. Okay. Not, hype, not, not going... Not, you got it. Not slow. That's perfect. Is that okay? Okay. So what are we seeing here? What are we looking at? Pardon? It's a vessel. Perfect. Well, so, so, so first of all, we're injecting contrast, right? And it's, it's there, bang. So it's likely what kind of vessel? Pardon? Well, um, it's there. I, I don't exactly have the timer. Can you see the timer there, Richard? No, it just says injection three minutes. Oh, no, there is a time there, but I can't. Yeah, so why did why did why is that happening? So so why I wanted to show this picture is exactly that. So the amount of contrast that we're injecting and the speed that we injected it at or it arrives here, for some reason, like this doesn't usually happen, but this aorta looks like this. So so what's happening? What so you're getting shadowing, right? Okay, so so what what will you try to we want to see something more. So what would you do to make this better? You might. And make it long. Make it, when you're injecting, don't do it so fast. Um, yeah, we could do the speed of injection. But what makes this one better is just by looking at a bit more of the clip. So, so when we're looking here, so this is a CUS, very early image. And so when we look at it, we can see that there's some liver and then we can see there's tissue in front and then we see that aorta. But so now let's look at this. Okay, so now what we're doing is we're just running the same clip, but I'm going to give you a bit more time. Okay, so now we've got that part where it's all shadowing. So now the person who's doing the scan is kind of scanning out to the left-hand side of the patient. And now they're scanning back into the midline and there's the aorta again. Where, and so now the aorta is not shadowed out. Did you see that? And so what's, what, what's, what's around that aorta? I'll show you this again. Lymphoma. Yeah. So when we look at this at 30 seconds, the aorta is still full, full, full of contrast. But now the concentration of the contrast has gone down so that it's no longer shadowing out the back of the area behind it. And so now we can see that we have enhancing lymph nodes all around the aorta. It's completely completely surrounded and so when we look at these later pictures we can see beautifully and so all of those your suggestions were good so like injecting less contrast would have improved it perhaps 
not injecting as fast might have improved it, but certainly waiting though a little bit of time where you're not at the peak of the injection. So in other words, we've passed the peak. And so even though the aorta is still filled with contrast, it doesn't have as much as it had right at the peak when we blasted the contrast in. And so that, now there's the grayscale pictures. So you can see the um, beautiful pictures really, right? So there's the aorta. And so the aorta, of course, the reason we don't appreciate that kind of shadowing normally is because normally the aorta sits right on the, on the bony structures so that it's right at the back. And so then we have shadowing from the bones on its own. You don't get that impression like it's floating in the, in the air or out there. But so that's a really beautiful example. And so now, especially as Richard showed, said more about this than I did today, on the machines that we have now, the question of, of increased attenuation and shadowing related to the amount of contrast or just related to contrast injection has become very important. Would you agree? It's really... Correct. Yeah, because yeah. the machines are more sensitive now. Yeah, and uh, so just more things happen that make it, that, that works out to be a problem. And so then there's the aorta when we use color dropper, which was always great. So with injection of contrast, there's a large volume of microbubbles in the aorta. They hide the deep retroperitoneal adenopathy. And then over time, the bubble concentration declines and the lymph nodes are evident. But so I think that's a really beautiful example. Yes. <laughs> Agree. Thank you, Sweetie. Now, okay, this is a patient who comes with a requisition that says query a renal mass. So tell me what you think about this, ca this case. Something in the upper pole. So that's what my tech came and said to me too. They said something's wrong with the upper pole of the kidney. The upper pole is normal, it's the right pole, but it isn't normal. Oh, so it's the... Pardon me? Try that once more, a little slower. Oh, the corticomedullary junction. Yeah, the cord. So the corticomedullary junction's in there. Okay, so, so we've had some guesses. So is the upper pole abnormal? Is the lower pole abnormal? Is there something at the corticomedullary junction? Okay, so, so this was a case where, you know, it's when you do what I do with all these brilliant girls around me all the time, it's very hard to make any positive contributions to what happens in your department because they do such a good job of everything. But when I looked at this one, I thought, oh, you guys, you're making a mistake because that's what they came and said to me. I had a senior tech and a student and the senior tech said to me, something's wrong with the upper pole of the kidney. And so then I said to the student, I said, what do you think? And she says, no, I think something's wrong with the lower pole of the kidney. So I said to them, you're both completely wrong. So why are they both completely wrong? What is wrong with this picture? It's an absolutely great case of what? What else can you see on this picture? Yeah, the spleen. And so what does the spleen often do? What is the spleen effectively? Like when we're looking at the spleen, on any scans like MR, CT, or ultrasound, what is the spleen basically? A bag of blood, really. So when you inject a big blast of contrast again, the spleen really enhances rapidly on CEUS. And so the same thing is happening here as happened to that aorta. So I, my thought myself was that this isn't an abnormal upper pole or an abnormal lower pole. This is a spleen that's really attenuating the, the beam beyond the, the spleen. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? So the, so the spleen is taking all of the energy, all of the um, whatever happens here, <laughs> so that the kidney looks like it's black. So now, so the interpretation is that there's nothing wrong with the upper pole or the lower pole, so we have to prove that. So how do we prove it? We do another injection where we're focused on the kidney below the level of the spleen so that we're not going through the spleen to get the tissue, the enhancement of the kidney upper pole. And so, just so I have to show that again, it didn't loop for some reason, I apologize. Hmm. So you can see that the kidney actually has no abnormality and both the upper pole and the lower pole are normal and that the abnormality was an artifact related to attenuation from the overlying spleen. And so when we look at those pictures, there we can see the normal kidney on the grayscale, and then we can see the uh, picture with the attenuation from the spleen, and then the normal picture of the kidney. So the spleen is effectively a bag of blood 
Therefore, in the arterial phase, it shows a similar transient attenuation with apparent hypoenhancement of all of the deep structures. Here, the upper pole of the kidney seems to be underperfused. So repositioning to avoid the spleen shows normal renal perfusion and normal morphology. So that's another good case. Great case. <laughs> okay. So this is another case. So um, this is a patient who had radiofrequency ablation of the caudate lobe. So tell me what you see there on that baseline scan on the left. Like what, what do we often see at radiofrequency ablation sites when we look at them on ultrasound? Are they usually black or white or they're mixed or what are they? Well, so, sorry, say that again. Yeah, so like right in the middle of the ablation zone, there's a there is something that looks like a, kind of like a echogenic thing inside it, right? So, so and that's quite common. So in other words, we get that kind of coagulation um, inside of, of ablation sites. And so oftentimes, they tend not to be black. They tend more often to be mixed or heterogeneous and have a, real mixed nature. So we can see that black um, appearance right there. So now I just want to show you when we do the contrast. Oh dear. I don't know if I have a movie. Okay, so there's where we start. And then at 23 seconds, so what do you think now about the ablation site? Does it look good or not? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be perfused. At 23 seconds, it looks absolutely great, right? And so then at 29 seconds, what do we see? So now there looks like there's some areas of, of looks like microbubble signal that's within the radiofrequency ablation site. And, and so although there's a little bit down deep inside it as well, how does that, um, how does that apparent area of perfusion inside correspond to that echogenic thing that we could see on the baseline? Pardon me? Fibrosis. Um, well, no, it's not fibrosis, but how does it correlate with that? Maybe, it's fully Maybe. sure. So not fully ablated is absolutely a great, a great thought. But, but so here at 29 seconds, we see that. And then we can see that at 1 minute 11 seconds, we still see this area that's inside that looks like it's microbubbles in there, right? And it does correlate like in other words, these images that I'm showing you, they're showing that there was nothing there early, right? Like so if we go back here, at 23 seconds, it doesn't look like there's any enhancement at all. It looks like it's perfect. And so then at 29 seconds, it looks like there's a little bit of enhancement that goes on all the way to 1 minute 11 seconds. So this is an artifact. So what is this an artifact from? What is this called? A mirror image artifact? Yeah, mirror image, but, like before we start the contrast, how we're supposed to not see anything on the screen except we might see the bright reflector. Yeah, we might see a bright reflector, but you see, but when we go back here, so let's go back. So when we go to the very beginning, so when we start out, we can see that there's nothing inside it, right? So it was black. So we can't credit anything to failure to suppress it. And so the, the thing about looking at patients who have radiofrequency ablation is that you can only interpret um, um, arterial phase enhancement, like the hyperenhancement that you'd see from residual or recurrent tumor. It must occur in the arterial phase. And so you can see now that the whole liver is already perfused here. I mean, we're, we're very early still, but the whole liver is already perfused. So if there was hepatocellular carcinoma, it would be enhancing there, like when the liver is enhancing. Whereas instead, by 29 seconds, you know that from our, when I said to you, we always look in seconds, we don't do it like CT and MR. So now we can see that as the liver is already perfused and we're coming to the portal phase or we're even in the portal phase, that now that nodule is starting to get bigger and look like it's in there. So yes, if you show me that one picture, and you didn't give me the time and you didn't give me the sequence, I would say, 
yeah, that could be recurrent tumor or residual tumor inside that wasn't ablated. But so, so what's this called when we have an echogenic focus that's within an ablation site on the grayscale scan, and then it shows um, apparent enhancement that does not correspond with the arterial phase. Like you can only get enhancement in the arterial phase. And so then you can see that when we go later, that we lose it. So this is an important artifact, and what, well, who knows what it's called? You know. Pseudo-enhancement. I call it shine through because it's those echogenic things that we're seeing are shining through as you get less bubbles, or you can call it pseudo-enhancement. Uh, well, th well, this pseudo-enhancement, so Peter Burns and, and Hojan Yu. So Hojan is a wonderful student that spent a year with me, and Peter obviously is my former physics colleague. But so they, wrote, they published this, and so this is a, what's called a nonlinear artifact. And so it occurs when you have an echogenic focus that's deep in the field of view. And it, fo it follows the microbubble contrast agent injection, but it does not ever correspond with the arterial phase. So in other words, it's not enhancement of what you see. Like it's not that you see that echogenic nodule and then you get enhancement of that nodule. It's, it's a, a, something that's there. I don't know if I'd call it shine through, but in any case, they call this nonlinear artifact. So they feel as though the microbubbles hit that echogenic thing and then they back and forth and then they make an artifact that's in that in that re region. So this is very important. And so when you're doing a scan, let's say, for example, if you're looking at a very echogenic nodule, so the echogenic nodule may show no enhancement at all in the arterial phase, or it may show enhancement or whatever, but in any case, and then it can all go away. And then over time, way late, you can start to see that the echogenic nodule will start to become bright again. And you're calling that shine through. I kind of agree with that use of shine through. But so what that's related to is the same thing. So the micro bubbles <coughs> related to that deep location of that echogenic focus make the bubbles, the bubbles go back and forth. Right. So we see this with angiomyolipomas in the <coughs> kidney. You can see them with hemangiomas. You can sometimes see it even with the diaphragm. Shining, you know, and again, I guess I should shine through because it's there. And if you look at your images and put cursors on where it's enhancing, it exactly corresponds to the, to the echogenic area. Yeah, so you have to always be careful about deep echogenic structures and always time anything that you you document related to them um, um, as related to the arterial phase. So, yeah. No, they're not there. Okay, so it's coming from like a different inhibition. Like it's coming, it's coming from a different death. Exactly. Like so, in other words, the bubbles that are way down deep in the liver that are accumulating in the liver, they start to go over and bang into it, and then they send echo back and forth. It tells the machine that there's something there, but it's kidding us. <laughs> and it's a very important one, don't you agree? Yes. Yeah. It, it's a very, very important concept that you don't want to not know about. So that's the last thing I'm going to tell you because it's so important. And so that's it, guys. So thank you very much from Richard and me. And um, and I like to just again extend, although I don't know who's listening to this, but you pass it on. To, where's your wife? But in any case, this has just been, in my opinion, except for this light shining on my face, this has been a, this great place to be. <laughs> and um, the venue's lovely. And um, all the food was terrific. I can't believe they gave us all those sweets. I ate two brownies. <laughs> but um, it was grand. And so I hope that you all enjoyed yourself. And please fill out your monkey survey and get your CME credits. Thank you. And thanks also, I don't know if anyone's here from our sponsors, but from, to our sponsors who make these events possible for us to have. It's terrific. Thank you.